There's been debate in the UK of the contribution of Muslims towards British society, especially with the rise of the extreme right in politics who try to show Muslims as the other. Of course, most people don't fall into this trap because when they go to get treated in the NHS, for example, by somebody who looks like me, then they realise that we're all just one big society with different races, cultures, religions. But recently, there has been a rise of people sharing far-right propaganda against Muslims. So I wondered, well, what can be done about this? And as a history nerd, I always find that history will always reveal the truth. So one day when I was driving back from work, I went to see my friend Thayab. And on the way, I had this idea for an adventure. But before I mentioned it to Thayab, I set up my phone so that you can see how that conversation went. So Thayab, what I was thinking, right, mm -hmm. was um, the extreme far right, they keep saying this thing where like Muslim contribution to British society is minimal mm. or yeah. that Muslims don't have a place in this country. Yeah. And uh, the thing I know is that my granddad was in the army. Okay. Now I know from your dad yeah. that your granddad was in the army Basically. as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure entirely. I think, I mean, he must have fought some, in something, right? I mean, it was during World War Two, so mm -hmm. I, I assumed he maybe he fought in it. I don't mm -hmm. know. He was on the British side, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was fighting for the Nazis. Side. Yeah, he was fighting for the Nazis. No, <laughs> no, but nowadays, if you actually look at it, right, every, the way everyone talks, it's as if like Muslims joined yeah. in with the Nazis yeah, exactly, and they were yeah, fighting. Yeah, exactly. It's the fact that history is completely whitewashed. Yeah, if you look at like um, the Dunkirk film, yeah. then it's like it's just white faces everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And but the history of Dunkirk, which I've looked into, yeah. is that there was a black battalion yeah. of black soldiers. What I'm suggesting is that. Let's go to Kew Gardens, okay. the archives at Kew Gardens. Let's get on train, go down to London. Yeah. Let's have a look at what our grandfathers did during the war. Yeah. And it might be interesting. Yeah. Have a scene. I mean, why not? Let's do it. Yeah. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. <laughs> this documentary is brought to you by Muslim History Journal. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel and subscribe. when you go online right uh, you always see these messages from people saying that like what did you muslims do for this country as a muslim in the uk who was born and bred here in the uk um you know i, I consider this my home you, you you feel a sense of you, that you don't belong here when people say that to you the extreme far right say that muslims have no part to play in the history of the uk they have no contribution they have not made any sacrifices for the for, for britain have you ever seen a picture of it, Randad? Mm, not that I remember, no. I think a good place to start would be to speak to my dad and see what he has to say. Thibs asked to speak to his father to find out about his granddad. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum Okay. I'm alright. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier that I had a few questions for you uh, mm -hmm. with regards to uh, granddad. Well, I don't really uh, know much about him. Um, you know, tell me, tell me a bit about him. Who was he? Who was he? Uh, your grandfather basically was born in 1901. 1901. Okay. He was in the army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was the first officer in the whole village. Oh. Uh, commission officer. Okay, commission. Officer. So he in the whole area, he is the first commission officer. Mm -hmm. So he came in in Britain 1940. Okay. In the Second World War. So he was and one of the people called. To Britain, basically. Yes, he was called to Britain, and he fought the Second World War. And he tells me that he, they were in France fighting the war really? against the Germans. <laughs> yes, he told me that he, 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 they fought in the front lines uh, against the Germans on behalf of the British. Really? Uh, yes, okay. yes. And uh, stationed in Woking. Okay. Woking yeah. is uh, in Surrey. Okay. The, after the war, when the war ended, the second he went back to Pakistan, mm -hmm. and he was he joined the Pakistan Army then. Oh, okay. Then he uh, retired as a major. Yeah. 
um, and uh, so he had a he, would, he had a rank in the in the Pakistan Army. British Army first, and British. then he went to the Pakistan Army, and then he had a rank in the Pakistan. Army. So in the British Army, what was his rank there? Or what was he was captain. Was a captain in the British yes, Army, and then he captain. moved to Pakistan. Then he moved to Pakistan, and then he was in Pakistani Army. Uh, I don't remember seeing uh, any pictures of him. Oh, oh well, uh, for that reason, I've uh, bought his passport for you. There's a photo in there. Okay, that's your grandfather. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. And that's when he was a slightly younger, when he had no beard. Yeah. That's very, there's yeah. a big difference there. <laughs> a big difference, yes. He looks nothing like I would have thought. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I can see a bit of a resemblance with you. Yes. <laughs> a bit uh, of you in there. <laughs> a bit of me, probably somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. Yes, yes. Dayab has discovered that his grandfather was in World War II and was potentially stationed in France. This is different to normal Indian soldiers who, towards the end of the war, were stationed in Burma and Africa. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, did he ever tell you what some of the battles were like? He said uh, when they were fighting the German, we were fly fighting in the front, and the same ranked English soldier would be there, but he would be at the back. Okay. And we would be fighting the front front line, facing all the artilleries in front. You know. So, the, do you ever want to be a British citizen? He said, No, no, I don't want to be a British citizen because. I feel, still feel the pain. That reminds me of um, a similar story with the Battle of Dunkirk as well. It's very interesting you say that they sent the Indians to the front line. But, I mean, we're always told here that we did nothing. And what you're saying is the complete opposite to that. You're saying that we sacrificed. We basically sacrificed sacrifice for this country. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a greater sacrifice. I mean, we, we, we feel proud of that. We, we really feel proud of that. Yeah. And uh, obviously we live in this country. And we are still, we love the country. Uh, we, we feel it is as our own country. So thanks for answering the questions. <laughs> it was very informative. <laughs> now that they have knew so much about his grandfather, it was time for us to go to London. So we booked ourselves train tickets for very early in the morning and off we went to London to explore. After the discoveries last night, Dave is now travelling to the National Archives in London. His first stop is the British Library, where British Indian Army records are kept. Some of the some of the things that uh, came out were just incredible. Um, seriously, uh, things like he was a captain in the British Indian Army. Um, he was on the front lines in France in World War Two. So he he led he led an, an absolutely incredible life uh, by the sounds of things. So we're we're going to look into that. We're going to explore the National Archive. We're going to take a look at what we can find out about his life and go from there. After several hours scouring through books and books of publications published quarterly over three centuries, Deb has still not got to any result. So we've just looked through a lot of the, um, the army logs and we can't find his name in any of the lists. Uh, I don't know whether we're barking up the wrong tree or looking through Indian army records. We don't know how we're going to get to where we need to get to. So yeah, we're, we're just hoping for the best at this point. That's my dad what regiment. Uh, my granddad was in the 83rd Battalion. I have no idea what that means. Um, I've asked the experts at the library what that means, and they don't know. We're going to have to go off other things and try and you know, match the dots and see what we, how we can figure that out. Deb has just searched online, and he thinks that AT might stand for animal transport. And if that's the case, then that would be the mule company. The Mule Company were the first British Indian soldiers to join World War II and were pioneers in the fight against Nazism. They fought alongside British troops in France, later being stationed in Wales. This matches exactly what Dayab's father told him last night about his grandfather being stationed in France and after that being stationed in Abergavenny. The hopes for once are up. What? <laughs> What's that one? What the hell? What did he do? I think this is him. So, if we, take, if we look at what my dad said, he joined the military in 23, 1923. Uh, and if you look down here, it says exactly that. Yeah, so, and then I think last night my dad said 
that he came to the UK in 1940 again, still part of the military. This record. Dave's now found his grandfather's record, but there's a twist in the tale. His records are kept with the British Army records at the National Archives in Kew. With hours to spare, Dave has booked the items he needs online and is rushing to queue before they close. The documents, which are closed until 2041, can only be booked with prior appointment. After scouring through three of the nine folders, Deb can't see any reference to his grandfather. And then he spots something. Under a document detailing the Dunkirk evacuation, we found Tayyab's grandfather's name, Fazal Dad Khan, leading his team out of Dunkirk. We had unknowingly been talking about Dunkirk from the beginning of this journey, just randomly annoyed at this movie that whitewashes history. And it wasn't just any black or brown faces that were being whitewashed, we found Tayyab's granddad was in Dunkirk. And he was the brown face being whitewashed out of history. In a war diary, an entry needs to be made every day by the most senior officer. This one reads as follows. Seven kilometres saved by last night shortcut. Visit from Force Commander and Major Plunkett. Colours marches again after driver and Jamadar Fazal Dad of reinforcement units fails to keep contact with the tail end of the company. And again at the bottom we find a reference to him again. Jamadar Fazaldad again loses his way in Safre. And then the records just keep giving. The war diary gives us an insight into Dave's grandfather's journey. He left from Bombay in the end of 1939 and in a few weeks he arrived at Marseille. From there they made their way up to Dunkirk where Dave's grandfather provided mules for the people fighting. But at the end of May, the fighting got intense and at times they were unable to make it into Dunkirk to help British soldiers and ended up facing the Germans themselves. In one account, they managed to get through and provide 400 mules to the British soldiers. In June, they make a daring escape through Le Mont Blanc, Nantes, and from there onto a ship called the SS Floristan in order to come back to Britain. Then German bombers start bombing them. And luckily, they escape to Plymouth and go on to Woking, which matches exactly with what Dave's father told him. The reason why the officer is commenting on Dave's grandfather getting lost is because despite being a high-ranking officer, he is sent to the front where his life is constantly on the line. Dave's father mentioned that Dave's grandfather was very upset about being sent forward while equal English officers stayed at the back. It seems we've found the reason where he was sent into danger at the front despite being a senior officer. Perhaps this is why he didn't become a British citizen. Another confusion is lifted for Dave. While he had been trying to search for a captain, he was a captain at the end of his military career. What Dave's discovered is at this point in history, he's a second lieutenant, which is a commissioned officer, but a lower rank than a captain. Later, he climbs the ranks to captain in the British Army and major in the Pakistani Army. One of the fascinating letters that we found in these national archives at Kew was a letter from a Muslim leader, Sirdar Iqbal Ali Shah, who is an Indian-Afghan author, traveller and diplomat living in the UK. He details in his letter that every single Indian soldier in France at that time fighting for Britain was Muslim. So with all this nonsense from France that Muslim history doesn't belong as part of French culture, well, when Fra France had been taken over by Nazis, it was Muslim soldiers who were there fighting to save your country from Nazism. It was Muslim soldiers from India who were, who were saving Nazism from arriving at the shores of Britain. Sirdar Iqbal Ali Shah, he details his concerns with regards to their dietary requirements and explains what they should watch out for. 
We see in the war diaries how his concerns are taken up and actioned, where then for the rations of the Indian army, where pork and brandy are taken off the menu. And we find the British army is very understanding and catering for their Muslim soldiers. Yeah, so up until last night, I hadn't even seen a picture of my granddad. Um, and dad was saying these quite kind of bizarre things. But the really weird thing about all of this is that we just confirmed that my grandfather actually was a war hero and fought in France in 1940. And he saved British lives. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> so how do you feel about the far right and what we went to investigate? My Muslim and British identity have no conflict. I've always felt that. My grandfather was a practicing Muslim and saved British and French lives. I'm honored by that, uh, despite all the discussions around foreign policy. Uh, funnily enough, we mentioned Dunkirk like a million times and about how it's all whitewashed and stuff. And yeah, they weren't just whitewashing any black and Asian faces. They were whitewashing my granddad's face. So yeah, there you have it. Um, ironic, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, is there anything you regret? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, nothing. We probably should have done this sooner. There is one sad thing though. Uh, my grandfather never wanted to become a British citizen. Mm, yeah. mm, okay, tell me about that. Um, so what actually happened there is, uh, in spite of being a high-ranked officer, he would get sent ahead of everybody else. Um, so basically he was like the guinea pig for all the white soldiers. Sounds, and everybody else. Sounded rough, didn't um, it? Yeah, it's really weird, right? Because he's a high-ranking officer too. So um, that's quite sad. I suppose your dad mentioned that at the beginning as well, that that's why he didn't want to... Um, yeah, we see that in the journal too, uh, where he's always getting sent up ahead and getting lost in the wild and stuff. Um, and yeah, it, it infuriated him. He rejected his British citizenship because of racism. It's, it's heroes like my granddad that we need in this world. And, the U and you'll get less of them as the UK divides more and more. This is the time to band together and show everyone what tolerance and respect can really do for a society. And so history had revealed the truth as it always does. When I looked into this a little bit more, I actually found that the mosque in Paris hid many thousands of Jews and helped them escape out of the country, pretending to be Muslims. There was no way to tell them apart, even when examined physically. And I know some people from the far right will watch this and say, well, there was a Mufti from Jerusalem who met with Hitler. Well, if we're going to play that game, then there was a cardinal who met with Hitler on behalf of the Pope. If we're going to play that game, then there was priests who blessed the Nazis as they went into war. But as a Muslim, I won't. I am obliged to tell the truth on history and tell history exactly how it was. This is why I've created this channel to tell history exactly as it was in the Muslim world. On that note, subscribe because we're going to have more com content like this. And on a side note, this is exactly the reason why I'm writing a book titled The 30 Days That Changed the Muslim World. It's to counter narratives like these that take hold in the world even though they are completely inaccurate. Coming back to what I said at the beginning, history will always reveal the truth of any matter when looked at it through an unbiased lens. So let us learn about Muslim history together. This documentary is brought to you by Muslim History Journal. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel and subscribe.